we're going to get started with Injection Wells 101, finding a place for our fracking waste. This webinar is brought to you by Frack Tracker Alliance, Environmental Health Project, Southeast PA, Torch Can Do, and Halt the Harm Network. So welcome everybody who joined us from all over. Uh, it's really cool to see so many people on the webinar right now. Um, we've got, uh, wow, 46 people in attendance at the moment. So it's that's really great. So I'll start by introducing myself. I'm the moderator for the webinar. My name is Ryan, and I'm part of the Help the Harm Network team. I started as a leader in the network, uh, working on an environmental radio show, and um, now I'm here moderating the session and really excited to be working to help bring this uh, this webinar to you today. So just a couple housekeeping guidelines before we start. Number one, today's discussion will be recorded, which is awesome. It means that you can pick up the replay and uh, share that as well. And if you're experiencing any difficulties, you can chat Prathana in the chat box in the bottom part of your control panel. And... Um, it should be on the right side of your screen if you're joining by computer. You can also just email info at haltheharm.net if you need any sort of technical assistance. And finally, at the very end, we have a short survey that will um, gather some feedback that you might have. We want to share this with our team and panelists as well so that we can improve. So here's how it's going to work. Our panelists are going to present for around 30 to 40 minutes, and after that, going to be followed by a Q&A. If you want to ask moderators a question or having any problems, again, there's the chat box. Just wanted to show it to you. <coughs> and uh, that's also how you ask a question. Prathana is going to be gathering the questions up so that when we get into the Q&A, um, we'll have all your questions there. So now I want to introduce the presenters today. So first is um, Jessa. And Jessa received her master's in social work from University of Pittsburgh. She focused on community organization and social administration, while also becoming certified in human services management. While studying at the university, she participated in a nine-month field placement at the Environmental Health Project, which led to her officially joining the organization after graduation. These experiences have specifically prepared her for her current position as case manager. In addition to her role as case manager, Jessa is the convener of the stress team and outreach team and a member of the health and wellness team at the Environmental Health Project. Uh, Ted is joining us from Frack Tracker. Ted's primary responsibilities at Frack Tracker Alliance include mapping and bringing light data gaps associated with the waste, water, and land use footprint of the unconventional oil and gas buildout across the Midwest and Great Lakes region, North America. And Felicia is joining us. Uh, Felicia is a wife, mother, and accidental activist, leader of the grassroots group Torch Can Do, and member of Buckeye Environmental Network. She has become a strong voice educating others about class two injection wells, not just for her community, but for the state of Ohio as well. So uh, thanks for Jessa, Ted, and Felicia for joining us. Excited to get into the presentation. So really quick, what's Halt the Harm? Halt the Harm is a national advocacy network that's designed to connect, serve, and support the individuals who are working to halt the harms caused by fracking. The goal as a network is to expand and strengthen the base of leaders and supporters in the movement, facilitate collaboration, by developing services to equip leaders with the tools and strategies they need to halt the harms of fracking in their local communities and ultimately to win the fight nationally. And since we started almost four years ago, the network has grown to more than 500 leaders and 13,000 supporters across 50 states. You can check it out at healttheharm.net. So here are some of the services that we offer. Alliance Map, Leader Directory, Campaign Support, Webinar Series, Help Center, Event Support, a Litigation Map, crowdfunding support, and zoning toolkit. Again, at haltaharm.net, you can find out about all the services. Primarily, this leader directory is really key. And leaders are the core of the network. They're individuals who are actively working and collaborating to help those living 
and communities that are negatively impacted by fracking. It can be anybody. It can be whether you're a concerned parent organizing other parents at their school against local drilling, or if you're a career organizer who's working for a larger group. So by joining the network, you have access to these free services and online directories. So that's just a sneak peek. And look out for an email from me in the next week or so, which will give you access to all these resources. So without further ado, let's get started with Jessa. Thanks for, for coming on. Jessa, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that great introduction, Ryan. And Thank you for everyone that's joining us tonight. We're so pleased to have you all on here. I plan to keep it very brief tonight since uh, we have Ted and Felicia, some great speakers lined up for you guys. Um, but just a little bit of an introduction. I think for some of us, this is a newer topic uh, while others have been dealing with this for a while. Uh, I know one of the biggest concerns I have and many people have voiced to me about injection wells um, is the issue with induced seismicity, along with the leaks and faulty cement, which we've seen nationwide. Um, Dr. Tony Ingrafia, he's a professor of engineering from Cornell University, uh, works a lot on this issue and we've been working with him to learn as much as we can about this. Uh, he wasn't able to participate tonight, but he was able to kind of give me some great comments to set the tone for this evening. So I just wanted to kind of share some of his words of wisdom about this issue. Uh, he stated that the problems associated with waste injection are going to increase in proportion to the increase in oil and gas production. The problems are fundamentally related to geology, which unfortunately we can't change and we know too little about at this time. But in effect, we are rolling the dice with nature flooding her geology with ever increasing volumes of waste. And he emphasized hoping that we don't trigger the bigger issues. And I think um, you'll hear a lot tonight from Ted and Felicia that'll really make you consider this and learn more about it. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Ted take over and it's all yours, Ted. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks everyone for being on the phone uh, at this time of day. Uh, my name is Ted Alk. I, as, as Ryan mentioned, I work at Frag Tracker, and uh, the big issues that really concern me about the oil and gas industry are basically how this industry has affected water quality and quantity, uh, its waste impact, and the land use impact that uh, well pads and gathering lines and that kind of thing are having on, on uh, you know, Appalachia, and I work across the Great Lakes. Um, but for tonight, for purposes of tonight, I'm going to focus on waste and the relationship between waste injection, water, and land use in Ohio, uh, because I think that, uh, you know, as, as has already been mentioned, waste is the thing that when the industry came into Ohio was really uh, avoided. Uh, and I think that if it had been highlighted or at least if it had been brought to the fore, forefront of the conversation, you would have found a lot more people that are currently agnostic or pro-drilling, they would have come, they, they definitely would have had a lot more uh, concern about this industry. So I, I'm going to bring to bear some of the data that we've, that we've compiled, some of the mapping we've done, the spatial analysis we've done to this conversation tonight. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but I don't think, I don't think it's, it's possible to talk about waste and the impact of the oil and gas industry uh, without talking about water, without talking about money, and without talking about oil and gas productivity, uh, as as was mentioned about uh, Tony and Gracia's point earlier. Uh, and by that, I mean that the relationship between water demand and brine production, that is uh, liquid waste uh, production from the oil and gas industry, is tight. That is a tight, positive relationship. As water demand goes up, brine waste production goes up too. Uh, and that's you know, that's, there's a, there's a direct link there, and I'll talk in, in a second about why that's very concerning given what we've seen in Ohio. With regard to money, uh, what I've seen in Ohio is that if you add in all of the water withdrawal and waste disposal costs for this industry, they're only spending about 0.25 to 0.28% of all well pad costs on this, these critical components of what they do. Uh, we basically give away water and we give away our geology. 
Uh, we're only charging the industry about $4 to $6 per thousand gallons for water, uh, for, for surface water. Um, that, you know, if you really added in, if you looked at water holistically, we'd be charging them at least $25 to $35. So these guys are getting away with it and their, and their business models are founded on cheap waste, cheap water, cheap land. And, uh, so, so there's the connection there. As far as productivity is concerned, what we've seen spatially, geographically in Ohio and West Virginia to a lesser degree is that as this industry has expanded out of the core counties where the, the, the drop-offs in productivity of oil and gas are even more exponential, uh, we're seeing them become more desperate. They're using more and more resources to get the same or less units of energy out of the ground. So that's, you know, that speaks to this desperation of these folks. And it's very concerning because the effect is going to trickle back into communities to water, your residential water demand, to ecosystems, to all sorts of things, because these guys can't contain, they can't control themselves. And they're going to be less willing to do that as they're going to, as their business models kind of crumble under the weight of, uh, of just diminishing returns on, on well, on wells. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I also think it's important to talk about this idea that, and this is a kind of idealized depiction in the center, this white box that you see here, this relationship between production and source demand. We've seen in Ohio that our wells fall off a cliff from year one to year two, both for oil and gas, at a rate of 85%. So 85% decline from year one to year two. The newer wells that are coming online, they're falling off a cliff even more steeply. So that's so productivity on a per well basis is dropping from the top left to the top to the bottom right, while resource demand is going from the bottom left to the top right at an even steeper rate. What does that mean? That means that the amount of energy that comes out of the ground per unit of energy put into the ground, that ratio is is just I mean it's 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 making an industry that was already gluttonous with regard to water waste and land become even more so. So you can see that the spread of this infrastructure, the spread of water, holding tanks, waste disposal is just becoming even more ubiquitous and, and just it, it, it's just more of a hodgepodge across Ohio and West Virginia. Next, next slide, please. But whether we like it or not, market forces the, the forces that are capitalism determine how these guys operate, and right now they're getting away with it because they're 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 getting their their water and they're f throwing away their waste for pennies on the dollar. This gra or this depict this screenshot on the left is from a recent New York Times article looking at water pricing globally. In the United States, we sell water for about ten dollars per thousand gallons to each resident, but we're selling, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, water to this to the oil and gas industry for four dollars to six dollars per thousand gallons. So if it, it, the, the price signal tells this industry that they can continue to ramp up water demand and waste disposal because they're not getting charged holistically for those resources. If we can move them more to the to the right on this figure, you would see that you would hope that we could bend their curve. I'm not saying that's a win, but I'm saying for this point, for the sake of this conversation, it's the least that they could do. Uh, next slide please. Which segues directly into some of these uh, demand curves that we've been working on nationally and here in Ohio. Uh, you can see here, this is, this is a figure, a quarterly, average quarterly uh, demand for water per Utica lateral, total water demand per quarter, and cumulative water demand uh, as of Q3 2016. So they've used about 11 billion gallons as of Q3 of 2016. But the point here is that purple line that you see there where you have these two, these two slopes. Uh, up to the end of Q, Q3 2013, the industry was using, you saw that the rate of change in water was slowly and steadily going up. Since the beginning of 2014, you've seen this inflection point in demand, and that's coincided with lower produ producing wells. They always cite 5 million gallons per well, but really we're talking about a 10 to 12 million gallon uh, per well regime that we're in today, which speaks to this rate of change, which is about eight to 12% per year. And I highlighted that in red because towards the end of this presentation, I'll show you where we are today. Uh, next slide. Uh, that rate of change in water demand, which again feeds into waste and I'll show you how it does. So 
uh, is not just in Ohio and West Virginia, it's national. We have a data set of about 55 to 60,000 wells across a bunch of different plays. And you can see here all across the country, oil and gas industry is using more and more water with less and less uh, waste coming out or less and less energy coming out. And obviously the, the, the figures didn't, didn't, didn't uh, translate here, but the blue line is basically the rate of change that you saw earlier. So across plays, they're using more and more water and the rate is, is quite disturbing, uh, which invokes all sorts of things about, you know, conflicts with agriculture, with public water supplies and that kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, we've talked about water, but you can't talk about waste if you don't set it up by talking about water. Here in Ohio, the injection waste problem is, uh, is one that the industry hasn't solved, and they're just, they're just kicking the can down the road. And as, as I said, it's highly dependent on the productivity and water demand. This map on the left shows water demand per lateral in the heart of the Utica play in Ohio. And you can see this ring of injection wells in brown around the place. So that says that where we're getting oil and gas out of the ground is not necessarily where we're disposing of waste. Some of the most concerning class two injection wells that I've seen are in places like Morrow County, which service, which is part of the Columbus uh, watershed supply, water supply, Ashtabula County in the northeast part of the state where we're seeing a relationship tight relationship between induced seismicity and, and waste disposal, and Washington County down on the Ohio River. Um, and then this figure on the bottom right, uh, the x-axis, that is the one going uh, left to right, shows average water demand across 20 or 22 counties in the state of Ohio per lateral, and brine produced per lateral on a county basis. So you can see it's a tight relationship between water used and uh, waste coming up out of the ground. Uh, next slide, please. These are just some screenshots of some maps that I've, I've been maintaining in my role here at Frack Tracker uh, that show the spatial relationship between Utica, Utica activity and some of the more recent induced seismicity events. You can see that at the top left. In the middle here, you can see the spatial relationship between productivity of gas and oil and water demand, which speaks to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, this relationship as that shows that where you get more oil and gas coming out of the ground, they use less and less water. And I've already told you that the industry is expanding to places where they're getting less and less oil and gas, which says they're going to need more water. And then on the bottom left, you can see the spatial relationship between where brine is being produced and where it's being disposed, which shows you, you know, some of the traffic, you know, the traffic pathways of this, of this uh, component of the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this one didn't come out very well, but basically this is just another example of the rate of change in uh, class two injection well. The red one is average per well uh, between Q3 and Q1 of 2016, Q3 2010 and Q1 of 2016. So you saw just like everything else, the price of oil uh, injection rates fell off a cliff, but they have definitely uh, picked up a little bit in recent times. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, th and they have picked up because we know that in parallel with permitting comes a parallel increase in waste disposal. Uh, you can see what I call the Trump bump. This is a permitting, this is cumulative and monthly permits in Utica Wells here in Ohio. And the permitting rate doesn't have to get back to the boom boom days of uh, 2012 and 2013 for the waste uh, pressure to be imposed on our injection wells because they're using more stuff per well. So they don't have to get back to this 80, 70, 70 to 90 permits per month. Even at this rate right now, where they're at the 40 to 50 permits per month, they're using so much more stuff to get energy out of the ground that their total effect on watersheds and on the waste uh, component is, is, is at least what it was back then. Uh, next slide, please. What's interesting here with this slide is that it's not just it's not just a function of where the well is, it's also a function of who owns the well. What we found is that there are a lot of large companies coming into Ohio, namely in this example, Stallion Oil Field Services, which has bought up these red wells. So what this graph is, this is average quarterly disposal of all of our injection wells, which is the blue line, and then the red line are those wells that this company Stallion bought. So you can see that it wasn't random the wells they bought, and once they bought the wells, they ramped up disposal volumes. Why? Because they see that there is, even though we're selling off our geology and our watersheds, 
the law of large numbers says that you can still make a lot of money by disposing of waste, which is what this company and other companies are doing right now. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing to, to, to keep in mind is that our class two inventory in the state of Ohio, as an example, are not necessarily designed for the volume and pressure regimes that they're currently being subjected to. This is a graph of the age at which our, our in, uh, class two injection well stock was approved and drilled. So you can see some of these are really old wells, which speaks to the, the point about those, the, the age of these wells and the certainty, the robustness of the containment of those wells, which, you know, also speaks to how many known unknowns and unknown unknowns there are in this uh, class two story. Uh, I think that I should probably say right now that the class two component of this industry is really more about what we don't know than what we do know. And that's, that's really concerning um, given the small sample size we have right now. Uh, next slide, please. I go around Ohio all the time photographing all sorts of components of the oil and gas infrastructure, and I have been photographing a lot of our class two wells to try to see you know, what, what do these things look like for presentations like this. And you can see here's a representation of what these wells look like. The ones on the top, those are wells just to the east between Cambridge, Ohio and Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the one on the bottom right is in Stark County. Interestingly enough, that well sits right above an athletic uh, facility in uh, Stark County where kids are playing softball and baseball and all that kind of stuff. The, the well on the bottom left, the Eastern Petroleum Services, that's in the Trouble County right on the uh, Pennsylvania border. I was just there a month ago and the guy that worked in that guard shack told me that they haven't had busier months in the six years he's been working at that well than they have than they did in July and August of this past year. Furthermore, that well, 80%, 80 to 5% of the waste that goes in that well comes from Pennsylvania. So this is a huge interstate uh, thing here too, because our wells are kind of propping up the industry in other states, which concerns a lot of people. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, I'll highlight the, the well on the bottom left. This is the Boffman Lucas well in Morrow County, which I mentioned earlier. This well sits in the Columbus, city of Columbus's water supply shed. Uh, and the idea that this is a well that is kind of redundant enough with regard to safety uh, to withstand any sort of spills is, is you know, is almost laughable. I mean, you, the quality of these wells and, and the infrastructure around them is, is, is quite concerning. This Monroe County or this Monroe well on the Pennsylvania border is interesting because 95% of the waste that goes into it comes from Pennsylvania. Furthermore, this, this well is it's, it's a very active well, uh, and it is surrounded by, uh, by uh, uh, Amish farmers. So there's all this you know, environmental justice issues associated with this. Uh, next slide, please. And then it was mentioned earlier about the induced seismicity. You know, this whole idea that you, the United States Geologic Survey used to think that quakes will happen, they will occur where they have occurred in the past. This map shows where they used to model quakes in the, the Ozarks, California, and Alaska. But on the right-hand side, you see a recent paper from USGS showing the quake clusters in Oklahoma. So we're kind of throwing this model of where quakes happen on its head, uh, which is, you know, something that we didn't, you know, I'm sure USGS didn't think they'd see in, in, in ever, for that matter. Uh, next slide, please. Induced seismicity, the side the human caused earthquakes is nothing new. As you can see here from a brief timeline of what we know about induced seismicity, but it must be pointed out that the frequency, intensity, and duration of quake activity is something that we have not seen. Same thing with climate change. You know, there's, there's climate change, but then there's human-caused climate change, which is more volatile. Uh, same goes for induced seismicity, uh, and, and this is an example of that. So yes, we, there is a history of induced seismicity, but not like what we're seeing today. Next slide, please. Uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this is an, this is a map of some work we've been doing, trying to model or model a spatial relationship between quake clusters in Oklahoma and Kansas, and Earth and Class II injection wells in those two states. It should be noted that Kansas and Oklahoma make up 22 to 23 percent of all the volumes disposed in the United States on an annual basis. So you see, this encompasses a great great amount of all the waste disposed in the United States. And we're seeing a very tight spatial relationship between quake clusters, those are the, the blue dots weighted by the size of the quake, and the light brown dots, which are weighted by the volumes disposed. So 
So you have cities like Oklahoma City, which are dramatically all, uh, affected by this kind of activity. So it's, it's a non-trivial effect, and it's not just being felt out in the, in, the, in the rural areas. It's being felt in urban areas as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and fortunately, the United States Geologic Survey recently issued a paper where they pointed out that uh, they they conclude that uh, the entire increase in earthquake rate is associated with fluid injection wells, which, you know, it's great to see that. I'm glad that USGS is finally on board and kind of acknowledging what's going on. What will happen under this administration with these kinds of studies is, is, is anybody's guess. Uh, next slide, please. It should be pointed out that we all think that these are magnitude two and three quakes, but indeed in Oklahoma, there's, and, and that is indeed the case here in Ohio, that you know these aren't the, the biggest quakes in the world, but their cumulative effect uh, is something that we don't know yet, but it has, it has to be, you know, that's the kind of thing that needs to be measured. But in Oklahoma, we're talking about 5.8, 6.2 quakes in places like Cushing, Oklahoma. And why does that matter? Because Cushing, Oklahoma is the crossroads of all oil and gas or all oil development in the United States and Canada. That is where we keep our federal oil reserves. So for those that aren't concerned about <clears throat> the effect of disposal on the communities where they are, they should be concerned about the price of the pump because if anything ever happens to the Cushing infrastructure that holds these strategic oil reserves, you're gonna see the price of the pump skyrocket. So you know we're gonna be pinched at the wallet if that's what, what, moves, what moves you. Uh, next slide, please. We've been, as I mentioned, we've been doing some work in Oklahoma, and what we found is, is that uh, homeowner insurers are pulling out across Oklahoma. Homeowner insurance policies are being challenged by those same insurers. Real estate values have plummeted. Uh, and you see here a quote from a woman in a, in a recent article talking about every time there's a little tremor now, you go gasp. Bracing yourself for the next one. It could happen anytime. Now, granted, these are people experiencing north of five, sometimes six magnitude quakes. But the cumulative effect of the small quakes here in Ohio is, you know, you can't argue that that's going to have an effect over the long run. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to point out one more thing before I talk about future concerns, and that is that we've talked a lot about liquid waste, but there is a whole solid waste component to this industry, the drilling muds, cuttings, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the radioactivity of that stuff, you know, with the small sample size we have from Pennsylvania, tells you that some of this stuff can be really, really hot. And the idea that it should be disposed of in municipal landfills is, is you know, it's, I mean, that it calls into question, you know, logic. Uh, but more importantly, what we do and what, what's happening here in Ohio is that we have not required our solid waste districts to partition drill cuttings from the regular uh, in, uh, stock, uh, feed stocks of waste into their landfills which is unfortunate because we know what the radioactivity of some of the stuff is, and we know that it's going to really, really stress the capacity of our, our existing landfills. Fortunately, we have a colleague in our uh, very helpful individual, Barb Walton, in the Columbiana Harrison Carroll Saw Waste District in Ohio, who's been collecting drill cuttings data voluntarily, because it's not required, uh, back to 2011, and she shares that data with me all the time. And she's very concerned because she's, she's concerned about the safety of her people, about the capacity of our landfills, and the idea that are we going to have to start permitting additional landfills and where are those going to go? We know where landfills tend to go. It's towards poor communities. And now you're going to ask for landfills to be permitted to take in this stuff, which can be radioactive in those kinds of communities. It just calls in all sorts of other you know, environmental justice, health justice questions. But more importantly here also is that the laterals in, the United, in, in Ohio, for example, are getting much, much longer by about 2.9 to 3.4% per year, which increases the volume of stuff that you got to dispose of in landfills. That 2.9 to 3.4, I'll show you why that's also being flipped on its head in a second. But you can see here, there's a whole solid waste component that gets very little attention because it's not causing quake activity. But if you ask people who live near the, um, some of these landfills, they're going to tell you they're way more worried about this stuff. Uh, and the regulatory framework in Ohio is almost non-existent for monitoring this, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, I'm going to finish up with some things that are kind of percolating right now. 
and that is these wastewater impoundments. And I'm starting to see, thanks to people that uh, live in some of these communities, they've brought them to, to my attention. This is a console energy wastewater impoundment. <clears throat> it's about three acres and 30 acres of land clearance. Millions of gallons of waste being stored in these facilities. Why? Well, because when the price of oil and gas goes down, you got to cut costs because you got to generate profit and return on investment for your shareholders. What's the best way to do that? Take your waste, put it in these pits, and let some of the volume evaporate, which concentrates the, the, the chemistry of the stuff. And these things are all over the state, but we really don't know how many there are. So this is another one of those known unknowns as it relates to waste disposal. But these are integral to the, to the uh, profit motive of this industry. They bank on having these things all over the place where they can kind of shirk some of their waste disposal responsibility. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then finally, <clears throat> there's this whole thing that's percolating right now, this, kind of, this idea of these super laterals. We have them in Noble County. Uh, I would say that probably Jimi Hendrix is probably not happy that one of them is called the Purple Haze. Uh, there's the outlaw well, the walleye pad, which is the walleye laterals, which are depicted here in this image right here on the bottom right. These wells are 17 to 20,000 feet in length. Meanwhile, our, our, our background level of wells was about 7,500 feet in length. So you're talking about, you know, uh, three to four times the length of laterals, which again feeds back into that landfill component. So that trajectory for landfill disposal is surely going to go up because we're concentrating where we dispose of it in about eight or nine landfills. Plus, they're using about 4,500 gallons per gallons of fresh water per lateral foot. These wells are. So these are super laterals with regard to length and what they use. Uh, originally, our Ohio wells used only about 9,700 to 1,000 gallons per lateral foot. So this is a dramatic increase. Everything I've just shown you with regard to some of the trend lines and resource demand is being just blown up by this development. Uh, it's very concerning because the idea that you are going to you're going to compromise watersheds, compromise um, neighbors in the name of just drilling these super laterals is, is quite concerning. This, uh, I think the outlaw well is going to use about 87 million gallons of fresh water. Again, speaking to what we found for several years now, that as these guys get more and more desperate, they are going to rely more and more on water and propent and chemicals to goose their wells to increase marginal uh, productivity. And you can see here what this means for waste disposal, waste volume, waste trucks. You know, it's just <clears throat> these super laterals are very concerning. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I'll finish up and, and yield to, to uh, everyone else here. Um, but I would just like to say that all of the data that we've been compiling and that my colleagues in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, New York, uh, California and elsewhere have been have been uh, compiling. You can find that all on our website. You can search for data sets by state uh, or um, or by topic. Uh, you can see we have some some states where we don't have good set, uh, data, but in Ohio, I think we have pretty good data. So in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, California, it's superior. So I speak for my colleagues by saying that you know we spent many years compiling this data and we're happy to share it free of charge. And, and that's what we that's what we're doing here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is basically what you can see. You're either going to see the data either as a map, as data sets, or as data downloads, whatever the case may be. But again, this is the kinds of data that we compile and try to give, give away to folks so that they can use it better and inform themselves. Because we do feel like, or at least I feel like, water and waste are the Achilles heel of this industry. And if we can highlight the effect that it's having on communities, on watersheds, I think that we can hopefully push back against this, against this gluttonous use of water and, and disposal of waste. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll give it up. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Ted, for... Oh, can everyone hear me? Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ted. Now uh, we got Felicia Mettler from Torch Can Do that's going to join us. Felicia, are you there? Hi. Yes. Uh, thank quick. you for having me. And thanks, Ted. That was a... Yes. Oh, I just want to remind everyone that if you have some questions during the presentation to add them in the chat, we have some already, which is great. So um, questions are being compiled. Um, and so same for you, Felicia. So people have questions for you. Okay. All right. 
All right, thank you. Um, and thank to all of you to, who took the time out of your schedules today to be on this webinar. I think it's, this is a really important issue. And I think that injection wells and frack waste has been put on the back burner um, because when you talk about fracking and, and you talk about the pipelines, you know, they're all very sexy issues. And I think injection wells is is becoming more of an issue and it's something that we need to make people aware of and educate people so thank you all for joining us um, i want to let you know that these slides that that they're going to show um, because i am going to be telling you a little bit more on a personal side um, i'm sharing a story living with uh, the injection wells and in our community so I'm not going to be really talking uh, per se about these injection wells. These are just some that are in Athens County and Washington County. Um, so, so please don't follow these injection wells thinking that I'm talking about them. Um, in the summer of 2015, our lives changed forever. That summer, my in-laws, Ron and Phyllis Reinhardt, started hearing loud noises. Um, in fact, Sometimes the noises were so loud, the only way that she can describe them is they were unnerving. There were times that she, she has high blood pressure, she would have to take a, a blood pressure pill to calm down. Um, they noticed that, that times that the water in their bird bath would be rippling for no reason. The odors, there were strong, unfamiliar odors in the air. Ron thought all these things were coming from a facility across the highway. So he began making phone calls and he tried to find out exactly what that was across the highway. And through some of those calls and inquir inquiries, someone contacted Roxanne Groff, who knew all too well what these were. She's a member of Athens County Fracking Action Network, or ACFAN. Roxanne contacted my mother and father-in-law and then came to their home and explained just what this facility was and what it does. That was the first time that we had ever heard the words injection wells and frack waste. And explained that they were living 1,800 feet from one of the largest sites in the state, which is the K&H injection well in Torch, Ohio. After we as a family discussed this together, we all we had more questions than we had answers and we talked with our friends and neighbors and they too didn't know anything about these wells um we found out later that you know these these wells they're put in overnight uh our communities are not informed um most of them you you, you got to look for them um they look like they look like something you know you would find the smaller ones you would just find on a mom and pop farm um, so Roxanne suggested that we hold com a community meeting. And then she, along with Heather Cantino, also from Axan, and Lauren Conley, they presented the first meeting in Coolville. Mind you, Coolville, our town, is population 492. Um, and I have found that they target small areas, um, poor areas, uh, which is where we are. Uh, we began to have a feeling about, you know, how can this be okay? The more we learned about these, the more angry we became. And again, we had more questions than we had answers. So we, all, we met some of the neighbors, um, Susie Quinn, who lives just down the highway from the K&H site. She too, she had been experiencing the smells, the chemical smells that would burn her nose she would have to go in and there's been times she has had to close the doors and windows and turn her air conditioner off granted you know susie is very sensitive to to smells so anytime there's a scent in the air she will call you know those that she needs to call and she'll call her neighbors to see if they smell things um, we have become kind of the watchdogs um, another community meeting was held and we became more and more concerned with what was being allowed in our communities, and we had no say. And we started feeling like, you know what, we're expendable. 
That's exactly how we feel. For one, we're appalled at the fact that this stuff even exists. And second, the lack of rules and regulations in the state of Ohio is insane. The most, the more, the, the more a few of us felt it absolutely necessary to learn everything we could about injection wells and frack waste and educate our community. We began meeting on regular basis with the mentoring of ACFAN and Buckeye Environmental Network, and we held regular community meetings, and that is how the grassroots group Torch Can Do began. We're now living in a time of when. When will the water we drink become contaminated and make us sick? There's no monitoring for our, wa our water to protect us if our community should have any leaks on these, these wells, nor is there any protection should a spill contaminate the surface water. They had to remove tons of dirt in 2015 when they had a spill. They were fined $50,000, which by the way, goes directly to ODNR oil and gas division. The community sees none of that. And the community also has never been made aware of any spills or mishaps. We have to find this out through watchdogging. When will the ground beneath us crack and damage our homes? It's been proven as, as you have just seen. There's a direct link to injection wells and earthquakes. There's a major fault line running in the county next to us, running from Coshocton to Marietta. The past couple years, there, have been, there has been seismic activity. When will the air we're breathing make us sick? In Ohio, there's no air monitoring. There's no monitoring for around these sites, nor the wells themselves. There is a park and torch less than two miles from the K&H. Baseball teams, they play baseball, baseball there all summer long and into the fall. What kind of air quality are they breathing? We don't know because there is no monitoring. One of Phyllis's biggest fears is when we have thunderstorms. It is the, is this gonna be the storm where the lightning strikes and hits the K and H causing an explosion, sending mass amounts of smoke into the air and contaminating everything for miles, including our water. Because frack waste is labeled as brine, it's deemed safe by our officials. If any of the above happen and we become sick, how are we to prove it? Who will pay for our medical bills when we become sick? We do. My mother-in-law has 14 members living in Torch. And, and her son, which is my husband, four miles from Torch. One daughter that lives north, north of here. So she would be the only one. And that's all the family that she has left. Should any of these things happen, we're talking about almost an entire family contaminated and affected. I live 10 miles downriver from the frost well and four miles from the K&H. And I live on the same property I grew up on. My mother and father live just, just above me. My two brothers live within one mile from me. That's our, that is my immediate family and that's all we have. What, that's a whole family that is going to be contaminated. That's a risk that is just too great to take. This community has, has seen its share of contamination by industry and how hard it is to prove. Years ago, the chemical plant DuPont knowingly leaked the chemical C8, which is used to make Teflon, into the Ohio River. This chemical causes cancer, kidney failure, and many died, and many, many are left living with this horrible health issues from the effect of the C8. It took years of court battles and even longer for folks to receive any compensation from this. Because our water company was involved in this class action suit, they sent out a letter to all the customers, 1,400 customers, 
basically, basically it was a disclaimer. Um, they, they just basically said because they do not know what's in frack waste, because by federal law they don't have to disclose what it is, they cannot protect us if there's a leak and it contaminates our water. They, have, they cannot put filters in place because they don't know what it is. So again, do we feel protected? No. August 2016, we conducted a study over a 24-hour period. And we each took shifts, um, basically pretty much all of us to about two hour shifts. We wanted to count how many trucks came into this facility because there was constant truck traffic in it. We counted 108 trucks in a 24 hour period. Approximately every 15 minutes, a truck came in. Most of these trucks came from out of state. And this went on, mind you, day and night. This, they didn't, there was no break. It was every 15 minutes. This year, for the second quarter of the K&H, it took in 1,845,165 barrels of waste. One barrel is 42 gallons. So let me break that tell you in, in gallons. That's 77,496,930 gallons of waste just in two quarters, which is half a year, into just one facility, which is the facility that we live closest to. There's a, there's a fee that ODNR Oil and Gas Division collects, and it's five cents for in-state waste and 20 cents for out-of-state waste. And that fee is collected up to 500,000 barrels. Well, these fees go directly to Oil and Gas Division. So again, the community sees nothing. This in turn creates a pretty good reason to keep ODNR to continue to allow these sites to operate as freely as possible. In 2017, or uh, there's a 2016, we counted there is 217 injection wells in operation in the state of Ohio and approximately 30 that are being permitted. If we, do, if we don't own the mineral rights to our property, to our land, they can put an injection well within 100 feet of our home. And most of the people in this area don't own the mineral rights to their land. They can also put uh, an injection well 100 feet from a school. Um, I was absolutely appalled to hear that. I, I could not believe that. Um, and I would like to share with you guys, two years ago is when I heard what an injection well was. I'd never heard that before. Um, and since then, since I have learned all this, I, I have this reoccurring vision, and it, I have it often. And I, I really would like to share this with you guys because this is really important, and I think it's this is how I live now. I didn't live this way two years ago when I didn't know anything. Picture it being spring and the air is just still a little crisp, but not yet cold. The kids haven't been outside in days. So I finally give in and I decide to call my friends and my neighbors, the ones with kids and, and ask them if they wanna go outside. They too have been cooped up for days. Yes, they agree. So I let my girls know we're going outside. And of course they're screaming with joy, yay, finally. So I let them tell them go get dressed, get the warm clothes on, because you know, it's still a little chilly out. So they get dressed and they get ready to go. Anxiously waiting at the door. And they put on their rubber boots and their rubber gloves and then the slicker coat and then their masks. Because you see, there's puddles of toxic waste in various places coming up from the ground. So we don't go outside very often. This is what I picture for my community and this is what I picture for our state of Ohio. And, it, and it, it's sounding like it's, it's happening in Pennsylvania. So 
stop this. Be, be, if you can get ahead of this, get ahead of it. Learn everything you can about these injection wells. I feel like um, I need to share with you too. I, I got to let you in on a secret because I remember the first time that I started learning about all this. I was in full support of fracking, by the way. And I, even though you're all muted, I heard you say, oh, really? I simply thought that fracking was really great, was good for the U.S., and, you know, we need gas and we need oil. And I didn't know anything about it. I just simply supported it because that's how I grew up. And as I began to learn about frack waste, of course, I learned about fracking. So with the education and the knowledge, I see things completely different now. So I, you know, for those of you who are on the fence and for those of you who have friends that, that still believe, you know, well, injection wells, you know, I really don't like those, but the fracking's okay, you know, or, you know, they think injection wells are okay because that's what, you know, our government is telling us. That's what ODNR is telling us that they're okay. But I want you to know that you can change somebody's mind through education. It can happen because it did for me. I, I'm living proof of that. So, um, so that's pretty much, you know, our story. That's some of our story. And I, I really hope that there is a lot of questions because I think mm -hmm. through the questions, we, we each learn more and, and it, it just, there's a lot, of, lot more information that comes out when we have a discussion. So I'm anxious to hear some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia. That was, uh, it was, it was great to hear your story. And we did get a, a number of questions came in while you're speaking. So we're going to get right to that. Just a moment real quick while I catch up on the slides. Um, thanks for sharing these pictures with us as well. Where can people find out more about Torch Can Do, Felicia? Um, we do have a, a Facebook page, um, torchcando.com. We also have a web page, torchcando.org. So right. please feel free right. to check yeah. out and see, you know, what we're all about. So I'll definitely make sure to add that in the in the notes for the webinar as well. So everyone, uh, check your email. There'll be there'll be links from from all three of our presenters. So now we're in the Q and A se Great. section of the webinar. So uh, we've got a, a number of questions prepared here, and I'm just going to jump right into it. So the way it's going to work is I'm going to read off the questions and. Uh, any of you three panelists can jump in. Um, some of the questions might be directed toward specific people. And um, and we're also getting toward the end of the webinar as well. So if you have to leave, uh, we totally understand. We'll be able to send you the replay. But stick around. The Q&A is always really interesting. So we'll get right in. Uh, Tammy asks, I'm curious to know if current and potential seismic activity is mapped in proximity with nuclear power plants. It's a great question. I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, no, but you've just given me something to do next week. <laughs> Demi. Great. So, um, Ted, we look forward to hearing back on that. And uh, uh, Daniel asks, could you give me a or could you give a list of chemicals that are in the liquid waste that is disposed into injection wells? Well, I, there's actually, it's hard to give you a list because they don't, by federal law, they don't have to give a list. Um, but I can tell you there's radon 226, 228, there's benzene, there's toluene, there's methane. Um, those are some of the really, really bad ones. Um, I think, I think it was 2015, a company had released, and this was in, in another state, but it had released what they used, the chemicals they used to frack, and it was like 1,100 chemicals that they used on a, just to frack. Wow. 
So, John asks, will the numerous coal mines have an effect during a quake? Uh, I know that uh, I know that some of these injection wells down in uh, Washington County and elsewhere are quite close to deep mines and to strip mines. Uh, the interaction between quakes, injection wells, and mines is, you know, I, far from understood. Uh, but there is, you know, there's there's proposals for injection wells, you know, even more injection wells near these mines uh, in Carroll County, Ohio, for example. They're talking about. Uh, they're talking about drilling straight uh, Utica laterals right through uh, a, a deep mine, a pillar mine. Uh, so, you know, the answer is, is uh, you know, we, we don't know. But I think more importantly, what, what we're saying here is that this, this component of the industry, to me, is the scariest component of, it all, of them all. And what you're finding from, from what my work is and others is, is like just how little we know. Um, and, you know, th that interaction is an important question. But, you know, when you only have a couple of people looking at injection wells across Appalachia and across the United States, for that matter, you know, the, the, the onus should fall on federal and state regulators to do answer these kinds of questions that you're asking, but they, they fail to do so each and every time. Another question, this one's from Greg. Any word on where 87 million gallons from Outlaw Lateral is going? uh well no it's not go it's going to the lateral and it's coming from uh you know a variety of um lakes i should have pointed out that lateral is going right beneath seneca lake in southeast ohio seneca lake happens to be a part of the muskingum uh watershed conservancy district which is a water source and a recreational uh, uh source of water for many many thousands of ohioans uh, and a lot of this water is coming from these surface and pound, sorry, these surface, um, uh, these surface bodies. And uh, I should point out one thing about that is we've added up all the water being used in Ohio, and we've added up the documented withdrawal points in Ohio, and we found that we can only account for 80% of the water that the industry is using. So your question about where is the 87 million gallons coming from, we could probably predict where 80% of it's coming from, but when you're talking about 87 million gallons, a whole big chunk of that water, we have no idea where it's coming from. Oftentimes, when you don't know where it's coming from, it's coming from streams, uh, first and second order streams. Got a, a question from Daniel. He says, here in Plum, Pennsylvania, we have an existing 28-year-old well that is being converted to an injection well. Could you weigh in on the risks of utilizing a 28-year-old well for no, this disposal? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yield to someone else. I have my thoughts, but given, uh, I'll, I'll yield on that one. That one I can't answer. That's a, that, that's a very technical question and I, I wouldn't attempt to answer it. But, you know, I mean, I will say that, you know, you saw from that figure that I presented to you that some of these class two saltwater disposal wells in Ohio are, are north of 40 and 50 years old. So, uh, Split that in half and then tell me if those, you know, were those wells designed for the volumes that they're going to be disposing of, the, the plum wells that you're talking about? Likely not. So, you know, at, the, at face value, it really concerns me the age of these wells. Ned is asking a question for Felicia and says, Felicia tells a devastating story and tells it very well. What do her own doctors think about this activity in the area? Do her doctors live in her community? That's a really good question, and we've touched base on that, but because because they they do not disclose the dangerous chemicals that they use, it's really hard to get doctors on board with testing for things until they find out what what they're going to be testing for. So that's a really good question. and i I wish that I had an answer. We've asked the same question. And uh, just another question from Ned is, what are the storage tanks I'm seeing in Felicia's slides above ground? What are those tanks? Um, those are the storage tanks. Um, an actual wellhead itself is actually very small. Um, it's almost like a water tap outside. Um, they're really small. Those, that's, 
they truck in the waste and they put them in those round barrels, the round storage tanks, and then from there it's piped to the actual wells with pressure. And sometimes, you know, that waste, there's some places that have like the K and H, it it has on site it has a uh, solidification tank. And I think it it held two million barrels, um, but they quit using that last year. It's it's no longer in operation. But what they did with that was they would dump the waste in that and then they would add sawdust to it till it was a solid and then take it to a landfill. So sometimes they can be they can be storing it and solidifying it and you don't know it. Another question came in uh, or, or comment actually looks like uh, it says, hello, my name is Brandon Richardson with Headwaters Defense. In addition to fighting an injection well, we're fighting for environmental justice in a town where PCBs and botched cleanups have left the community a toxic mess. Now in this town, nearly 40% of residents have died from cancer or started the fight against cancer. The events leading up to the ban of PCBs in 1979 are similar to what we are going through now. Could these host organizations of this webinar look into what led to banning PCBs and see how we could apply that to banning fracking waste? If we don't do it soon, these towns will end up like Minden, West Virginia. So I guess the question is- Gosh, that's very you know, powerful. And yes, we, yeah. we can. Um, and this, yeah. you, and you, this is all being recorded and we're writing down information and absolutely we can try and, and do what we can and get back with you. Um, Maybe sometime next week, um, you and I can have a conversation, um, and I can get in touch with people that that also know a whole lot more than me. Hmm. All right, Doug. Doug asks, "What should we know in states like Idaho that do not currently have a Class Two injection well program, but are looking forward to taking over primacy from EPA? Are there resources?" or best management practices we can use to ensure the state creates the best possible waste disposal program? Um, well, personally, in my opinion, there is no really good injection well waste, frack waste program, period. Frack waste should not exist. Um, a, a more educated answer, Ted could probably give you a, a more educated answer on that. Well, I would just say that, I mean, I, I agree completely with what you just said, and I would just add that um, this idea that we can dispose of waste and injection wells and landfills, they're just shirking their responsibility, kicking the can down the road. And, what you know, there's a lot of people in Ohio that talk about this idea that the waste that these guys produce, liquid and solid, should not be anywhere near Ohio. It should be arid environments where it doesn't it isn't subjected to the elements of weather like it is here. I mean, the, again, disposal wells and landfill disposal of waste is just allowing the business models of these guys to just kind of, you know, just, just wait along. And the idea that Idaho is going to take over primacy, you know, that depends. I mean, taking over primacy of injection wells from this EPA run by Scott Pruitt, who ran Oklahoma, who I just showed you what happened there, might be a good thing. But the idea that primacy is going to, that Ohio, Idaho is going to do it better than EPA, I mean, I've looked at states all over the United States with primacy or not over their injection wells and, you know, the quality of those wells and, and oversight, you know, varies quite a bit. So just because you have primacy at, at the state level doesn't mean you're going to have a, a good program, but it might be better than EPA right now, for sure. We have a few more questions. So um, one from Brett, who says, which of the current types of storage facilities represent the greatest short-term versus long-term risks of toxic release? I think that those, uh, and let me just say this quickly and then I'll yield. Um, I think those console impoundments that I showed you, those are one of the scariest things I've, I've seen. Um, the, <clears throat> those, you know, depending on, you know, if you, if, if you see a brine truck and we have seen brine trucks backing up to those impoundments, putting, putting a whole bunch of waste in those things, if that happens to occur before a large rain event and you have overflow, uh, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. 
I think that these wastewater impoundments, just because of their exposure to the elements, are the worst thing. But the, the class two, you know, saltwater wells aren't that far behind, in my opinion. Sharon's asking, has anyone tried educating the soil and water conservancy districts, which are government run in Ohio? Yeah, they're really concerned. I have not. They're, yeah, I, I mean, I know that they're concerned about this. They're concerned about the effect that, uh, that's a great question. They're concerned about how this will affect soil quality, uh, water quality, agricultural productivity. Um, so to the extent that they're concerned, that's why they're concerned but they're not really moving the needle. I mean, I think in Ohio, at least, it'd be great to get the Farm Bureau up in arms about this, the water and waste impact of this industry, because the biggest competitor for these resources in certain parts of the state is gonna be agriculture. And if we can get them kind of hot and bothered about this whole water waste issue, I think we have a really good partner. But until then, you know, I think the Farm Bureau is gonna be someone that's really gonna push back against this industry eventually. I agree. All right, so we've got uh, just two more questions, and then we're going to wrap up the webinar. So this has been this has been awesome. So just two more questions. John says, "Is there a coordination between Frack Tracker and Environmental Health Channel?" Uh, I would have to. I have I've never heard of Environmental Health Channel, um, but maybe some of my colleagues in Pennsylvania have. I don't want to speak out of school saying there is none. But from my vantage point in Ohio, I, I, I had never interacted with them. And finally, so the environmental oh, yeah. health. Oh, I was just going to say oh, thanks, we Jessa. just yeah. recently launched that here at um, EHP, um, and I know there have been some discussions um, with uh, Brooke and Matt Kelso at Frack Tracker about you know kind of working together and really um, bringing some more levels to the environmental change health channel so that's kind of in the works right now cool and you'll tell us more about it i'm sure right jessa yes <laughs> cool so last last question says uh, this is from brent it says hi i am born and raised in northeast montana my grandparents homesteaded in mckenzie county in northwest north dakota i've lived and seen the oil and gas industry um, in montana and north dakota now I live in Idaho. My question, how active is Frack Tracker in North Dakota and Montana? I'm an active member of the Idaho Organization of Resource Councils and Northern Organization of Resource Councils. Again, how active is Frack Tracker in that area? I'm sorry, the states were again? Montana, North Dakota, and Idaho. Right. So uh, Matt Kelso has been working more on that geography, uh, and I know he has developed some really good oil and gas development maps for those three states, uh, if not if not all three, at least two of them. But developing a stronger relationship with people like you and, and your organization and others would be something I'd really be interested in. So I think my contact information was on this webinar, or you can find us at www.fracktracker.org. It would be really great to strengthen that collaboration for sure. Awesome. So thank you so much to all the panelists today for their comprehensive knowledge on this matter. And, and uh, that's all the time we have left for questions. If you have any questions that aren't answered, you can include them in the comments section of the survey, which you're going to get in a separate email right after the webinar ends. And if you were joining via phone or your internet speed didn't allow you to view the slides, don't worry. We're sending the um, information out the replay. You'll be able to watch that online as well. Um, and thank you so much, Ted, Felicia, and Jessa for sharing with us the work that you're doing. And so I want to thank, thank you. you. Thanks everybody for taking the time to join us and participate. And if you have any webinar ideas, then make sure that you contact us at healthharm.net because we would love to hear from you and we'd love to help you get access to those services. And so check it out and we'll send you all the links as well that came up during our conversation from uh, from Felicia from Torch Can Do also the environmental health project all right great thank you thank you yeah thanks so much everybody take care bye bye
Bye. Thank you.